Liam, are you here with us? Yep, I'm here. Can everyone see me all right? Great. Yep. So Liam Farrell is a doctoral candidate in theological studies at Regis College and the University of Toronto. He's currently writing his dissertation, which is tentatively titled Onto the Holy Hill and Into Thy Tabernacles, Deification Through, With, and In Christ and His Church, according to Thomas Aquinas's Hostilis Super Salmos. He looks forward to a day, as we all do, when we can have Lonergan on the Edge in person again, both to enjoy the company of his fellow scholars and to be able to come to Milwaukee to enjoy the wonderful cheese curds. So, without further ado, Liam Farrell, the role of the first phase of functional specialization in helping white Americans authentically decide to become anti-racist. Thanks, Chris. Um, I should preface this by saying that this is kind of my first foray into something I've been thinking about that I hope will become a longer but also a more collaborative work that is done by people who are more qualified than me to who actually operate in these functional specialties but um i guess you have to start somewhere so here we go um can everyone hear me all right all right liam maybe like to... if you can just talk a little bit louder i think it would be helpful oh sure yeah is this better yes all right i'd like to frame this paper with a quote that i saw for the first time written on the protest sign of a young black teenager on the street near my Toronto apartment as people gathered in a nearby park to protest both the murder of George Floyd and more locally the suspicious circumstances surrounding the death of Regis Kaczynski Paquette. The quote on the sign, which I later discovered was from actress and activist Amanda Beals, was simple yet profound. You cannot enjoy the rhythm and ignore the blues. The quote deeply moved me and simultaneously registered as one of the most Lonerganian things I had ever seen, given the fact that it proposed to its intended reader that they make an authentic decision rooted in historical fact as to whether or not they should become anti-racist. Um, as I am sure anyone familiar with Lonergan would tell you, the decision to become anti-racist should, in theory, be a textbook example of what Lonergan refers to as a good decision. It is a conscious choice to commit oneself to cooperate with God's grace in order to self transcend the biases that exist in culture and make an attentive, intelligent, reasonable, responsible, and loving decision to love members of racial minority groups equally and unconditionally. And I would add for Christians, it's a call to bear witness to the profound truth that black, indigenous, and other people of color are made in the image and likeness of the God who loves them. And yet, in spite of this, the decision to become anti-racist, to attempt to resist not just the racist viewpoints and actions found to be prevalent in group biases and shorter cycles of decline, but the systematic racism found at the core of Canadian American society appears to be an extremely rare feat. As the events of the past few months have, sh have shown us, a large part of this rarity likely comes from the fact that Within the majority population, most people do not fully understand what racism is or how it is present in society. Therefore, before we can discuss how to become an anti-racist, we have to examine these things. We have to start, I think, by acknowledging that racism is, as Brian and Massengale observe, a culture in the sense that Lonergan defines culture. That is, it is to quote, part of the range of meanings and values that define a human group. In this case, white Canadians and Americans. Racism, Massengale informs us, refers to the underlying set of meanings and values attached to skin color, a way of interpreting skin differences that pervades the collective convictions, conventions, and practices of American life. Massengale expands on Lonergan's notion of culture by emphasizing that culture itself has four distinct points. It's shared. It is a learned set of meanings and values, which are, quote, transmitted from generation to generation through learning, end quote. And it's formative in shaping the identity of its members, 
Massengale reminds us that Lonergan notes in his second collection that all human doing, saying, and thinking occurs within the context of a culture and consists in the main of using that culture. It is within cultures, it is historically available, that provides the matrix within which persons develop and that supplies the meaning and values that inform their lives, end quote. Finally, it's symbolic. It's what Lonergan calls, quote, human embodied, meanings embodied in human intersubjectivity, end quote, which Massingdale notes are more than just, quote, markers or tribal membership, end quote. They are, quote, also the icons of people's identity and representation of the soul of a people, end quote. It is for this reason, Massingdale notes, that we may learn to master and understand the externals of a culture. We cannot master what is at the core, quote, the internal, the people's soul, a set of meanings and values that is an individual and social group's identity, the frame of reference through which they look at the world, end quote. So following Massingale's logic, we come to the uncomfortable conclusion, and it should be reminded here that Father Massingale always says that for white people being uncomfortable talking about race is a necessity, that racism is inherently built into white American culture. And for that matter, white Canadian culture, both due to Canada's dependence on America for socio-cultural guidance via popular culture mostly, and because of Canada's own racist history, um, not just with First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, but also with Black Canadians. So how does the racism, which we've, I've noted is, already noted is a common sense level, at the common sense level an error, how does it become an intrinsic part of the majority culture? The answer is that it's a series of poor decisions predicated off inverse insights, which have created a culture in which bias and racism can thrive. What makes racism particularly terrible, and Father Doran alluded to this, in his opening comments is that it can manage to present itself as really any type of bias. Um, I would, I'm going to talk though about three places where it's particularly common. I think group bias, general bias, and with what John Dodowski has defined as intellectualist bias, which is the privileging of the world of theory over the world of common sense. Um, I proposed as a kind of overt racism that I think most people today would immediately call to mind when they think of racism exists in the realm of group bias, where systemic racism, the kind which has been programmed into North American society since even prior to 1619, and has allowed white people to be ignorant and of our overt and covert racist actions and attitudes, is primarily found and perpetuated in general and intellectualist biases as well as in reactions to the group bias of racism influenced by these general and intellectualist biases, which often lead to overtly racist actions being dismissed on an individual and group level. Due to the persistence of these types of biases, North America has been stuck, stuck almost since its foundation, even prior to its foundation as an official, as official colonies, in the longer cycle of decline, which furthers and perpetuates the initial ignorance of the normative functions of the general empirical method and the corresponding misjudgments of value made by the original European colonists. Furthermore, due to the shared nature of human knowledge and culture, these biases have been entrenched, often unconsciously, in each succeeding generation. So that, again, to quote Massengale, White culture sees itself as the measure of what is real, standard, and normative. This viewpoint not only others BIPOC Americans, it forces them to other themselves. This combination of intrinsic systematic racism, ignorance of or deflecting the realities of the overt, often violent actions of a society that, as Kwame Torr and Charles B. Hamilton remind us, continues to allow, quote, the predication of decisions and policies on considerations of race for the purpose of subordinating a racial group or groups and maintaining control over that group or groups. The othering of minorities and the shorter and longer cycles of decline perpetuated by these things not, to not only create a racist culture among the majority, but also to create an atmosphere of what Martin J. Carter refers to as neutron violence. As Carter notes, 
A neutron bomb can destroy life without destroying property. The detonation of a neutron bomb over a city could conceivably destroy all the life in the city while leaving the buildings unmolested. Neutron violence destroys the mind and leaves the body intact by creating and enabling situations and conditions that snatch the dignity and worth from black individuals. Taken together, these things lead to what Carter calls the effects of terror, the daily violation of identity, and the constant denial of opportun the opportunity to have or achieve goals for BIPOC Canadians and Americans. Unfortunately, many white Canadians and Americans, while being opposed to overt racial violence, have been willfully ignorant of the implicit bias within society and the neutron violence that both of these things create. In these cases, whether consciously or inadvertently, what Lonergan calls in insight, the love of light found within humanity is overshadowed in the majority, whether we know it or not, by what he calls the light of the love of darkness, which causes us to borrow a phrase from the poet Dylan Thomas, to be content to go gentle into that good night, rather than, as Carter puts it, choosing to participate in the life of the Prince of Peace by eradicating neutron violence and working for justice which she describes as the charity of our time and the absolute prerequisite for peace. The tragic events of the past few months, the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and many others in the United States, as well as the suspicious death of Afro-Indigenous woman Regis Korczynski Paquette, the shooting of Chantelle Moore, an Indigenous woman during a police wellness check, and the murder of the indigenous man, Rodney Levi, who was having dinner in his pastor's home by police here in Canada, as well as so many other senseless acts of violence and hatred predicated on race all over the world, have shown that in the 37 years since Carter was writing, this justice has not been achieved. I think it might be fair to say, though, that the events of the past few months have served for many people as the beginning of a cosmopolis, and have not only shown many white Canadians and Americans the reality of their unconscious racist behavior, but have created in them a desire to be authentically anti-racist. And again, to borrow a phrase from Dylan Thomas, rage, rage against the dying of the light. So if I had more time, I would go into a more eloquent or at least a more verbose segue, but I should probably get to the second half of my paper too stay within the time limits. So I'll simply say that I think everyone's in agreement that in order to achieve peace within the world, we achieve we need justice. In order to achieve racial justice within North America and the world, white people need to respond to God's the grace God is undoubtedly offering in order to become truly anti-racist, be a be a, an attentive, intelligent, reasonable, and responsible and loving decision to do so. As good readers of Lonergan, we know, however, that grace must be cooperated with and that virtue must be cultivated in the intellect and the will. So in my remaining time, I'd like to show how the four functional special first four functional specialties may be used in a way by which one may begin to compassionately appreciate, since white people will never fully understand, the struggles faced by BIPOC Canadians and Americans to identify the ways in which the white majority culture has contributed to this struggle and to provide the opportunity to experience a conversion within ourselves to become anti-racist, which hopefully not only leads to the uprooting of systematic racism from the majority culture, but as a result of such, eliminates the concept of majority culture altogether. So it's important to note before I go on, there's a huge difference between becoming anti-racist, which means to become an ally and being a white savior, which I am not endorsing. Anti-racist behavior for white Canadians and Americans is about correcting our mistakes in order to dismantle the systemic racism and racist attitudes in our culture and in ourselves, both in the private and the public sphere, while at the same time acknowledging our limitations and recognizing that we will never truly understand or experience what BIPOC people experience. White savior ideology, on the other hand, is the kind of thinking that perpetuates the perverse idea that someone from a minority culture needs to be saved from that culture in order to thrive. We saw this for years. We 
still see it, but we saw this for years in the United States and especially here in Canada where I am with the residential schools and their employment of the cultural genocidal programs which would remove a native child from their parents and send them to these schools in order to, and I'm cleaning up the language here, kill the native in him and save the man. In fact, an anti-racist should recognize that the white savior complex is itself a fruit of the poison tree of racist thinking. I would also think that the white savior complex, as I understand it, is theologically problematic. And there is only one savior who, as part of the triune God, created each person fearfully and wonderfully the way in which they are and willed them to be born into the culture in which they were born. And as the and the same, in the same way as Savior assumed human nature and entered into history into the cultural context of a Middle Eastern Jew. So how can Lonergan's first four functional specialties be used to become anti-racist? I think I'm almost out of time and I realize that so I realize that what I think I'm gonna do is presume your familiarity with the specialties and just highlight some things within each one that I think will allow for them to help white Canadians and Americans become accurate. So, firstly, we have research. I think the key way to use this functional specialty is to use it to find minority voices that have been there from the get-go and introduce them into our research intake. As Lonergan and Massengale have both shown us, we gain our culture from what we observe and from where we are immersed. So if white culture has an unconscious bias, or fails to recognize its systemic racist problems, then in order to become anti-racist, we probably need to expand our sources beyond white culture. We need to read minority authors, read minority histories, and in doing so, be again prepared to become uncomfortable with what we find. And we need to learn to exist in these uncomfortable tensions that will undoubtedly emerge as we attempt to become more aware of the world we live in and the history of this world. We also need to accept in doing this that we may need to reevaluate the process by which each area, specific area of research is weighted to correct for the implicit biases that exist within us and within society and to support Lonergan's statement that, quote, there exist disparate cultures and diverse differentiations of consciousness and such differentiations are to be bridged by working out the subtle, suitable transposition from one culture to another or from one differentiation of conscience to another, this to another, with Massingdale's point that culture is something that exists within the soul, and that as such, we have to acknowledge that any cultural translation we may do must always be viewed as a translation in the sense of the old axiom that the translator is a traitor and something of the original culture will be lost in translation. Interpretation is also crucial in becoming an anti-racist. It's, it's within interpretation that basic exegetical operations that not only does a white person, I think, come to understand and appreciate the rhythm, the fact that rhythms of minority culture must be accompanied by their blues, but where they will, through proper interpretation of the object, the words, and the author, in context come to really, I think, acknowledge and accept the hardships faced by BIPOC Canadian Americans and the way in which white Ameri Canadian Americans have caused and exacerbated these hardships, thus allowing them, allowing us to engage with those blues with a genuine solidarity that acknowledges both the reality of a pain we'll never understand and our complicity with in causing it without attempting to appropriate it. Um, in order to make sure this happens, I think one has to be careful not to fall into the intellectualist bias, which Jadowski has identified. At least one begin to think that a theoretical understanding of the blues can match the lived experience of BIPOC Canadians and Americans. This is also the specialty in which one must come to understand oneself. This is key to becoming an anti-racist as it allows one, upon reviewing the biases in society, informed by the perspective of those against whom society is biased to do a thorough examination of conscience of oneself to discern which of and where these biases are present in their own person and to make the decision 
to not only acknowledge these biases, but to eliminate them. I should say a lot more about interpretation as it's the functional specialty in which I do most of my work, but I want to get done. So I'm going to move on quickly and nowhere near as fully as I ought to to comment on both history and dialectic. So Lonergan offers many insights towards redoing history that I think can be used to redo history in an anti-racist way, but I feel that there are three which are particularly beneficial and I would like to touch on. The first is the distinction between basic and general history. As a historical theologian, I find that far too often the idea of general history, which is the combination of basic and specialist history, is just actually absorbed into or replaced by basic history. Um, I think this is likely due to the fact that non-experts in history are willing to acknowledge when discussing history that a specialist history exists, but they don't really go out of their way to use it to complete basic history. Um, because of this, things such as the racist attitudes of, say, the Founding Fathers or the Fathers of Confederation, which are discussed in specialist history, are often absent from the history that is viewed by the general public. So, by encouraging the development and actual use of a more comprehensive general history, historians could create a space for both minority historians and historians of minorities to move out of the specialist field and into the realm of general and via general basic history, thus giving voice to the struggles and the biases which have always been there and need to be addressed. Um, the second point I think we could take for history from history, which is somewhat related to the first point, is Lonergan's insistence that biographers, while having a different emphasis, must use the same methodology as the historian by focusing on the life and times instead of just the life. As I just noted, there are many descriptions of prominent persons that exist in the realm of basic history that if they do actually provide a description of those persons' faults, when critically analyzed, provide just enough context to allow people to try to excuse the faults in question as being part of a task. And this can be done because only a limited context is provided, I think, by focusing on the general history of both the life and times. Biographers might be able to discover that a person had biases or views which we would not only recognize now as bigoted, but were in fact bigoted even for their time and thus have to reinterpret the writings and legacies of a person based on this new information. We're facing this struggle in Canada now with our Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald, as historians are sort of, first Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald, as historians are starting to realize he wasn't just a racist for our time. In his own time, he was considered racist. Um, so we have to reevaluate, you know, his legacy. Um, but Finally, one must look at Lonergan's notion of the difference between pre-critical and critical history, not only to ensure that we have a good and properly interpreted critical history that will allow us to advance to the stage of dialectics, but also so that in gaining familiarity with the aspects of pre-critical history, we have the insight that perhaps outside of the academy, pre-critical history is still the standard mode of operations for the majority of white Canadians and Americans especially in dealing with a topic as difficult as race. I believe that this is the case and that if we confront the intellectualist bias that everyone does critical history, we as scholars will be able to both more thoroughly listen to experiences of people outside of the academy and to expand upon our complex and often redacted histories with greater interiority. Now I'm almost out of time, which is unfortunate, I think, because dialectics is probably the most important because it's through dialectics that we put what we've learned to the test in order to reach new horizons that will, God willing, through and in cooperation with God's grace, bring us to conversion. To avoid going over time, I will only say that methodologically speaking, Lonergan's chapter on dialectics can almost be directly translated from being used as a method in theology to, I think, being used as a method to for anti-racist scholarship. I would only add that I would strongly encourage people, both in theology and anti-racism, likely, to supplement it with Father Doran's introductions of psychic conversion and the dialectics of contraries and contradictions, 
both of which I think have a very significant role to play in becoming anti-racist, given that the repressive role of racist ideologies in a person's psychic development, obviously, is something that is blocking in the true center, and the need to examine and root out where biases may be hidden in our history, respectively, will no doubt involve the discovery of many contrary judgments as well as many contradictions between what has we have historically believed and what is actually true. So I'd just like to conclude by saying that I hope that this presentation has in some small way shown how the thought of Bernard Lonergan can be helpful in doing the work of becoming anti-racist and achieving the justice and peace for which we should all desire. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Liam, very much. Obviously a very relevant and powerful topic. Are there other questions that people would like to pose? There is one uh, dialogue box quick. I'll, I'll read from Michael Rogers. And he says, thanks for your paper, Liam. I wonder if Neil Ormerod's conception of how original sin is passed between generations is helpful for your work and might get at social structures in a way in which conveys the need for conversion and the type of horizon shift that needed that needed on Lonergan's account helpfully. So I don't know if you've heard of that or if that's something that you've read or. I mean, I haven't read it as fully as I should. I've heard of it. I think that definitely um, racism has to do with because I haven't read it, I probably can't give a more full answer and I probably should read it based on what Michael has just described. So thank you for bringing it to my attention. But I definitely think that you race the racism, the original sin and the social sins all tie into bias. I mean, it is the original sin and the concupiscence uh, from a Catholic vision, our tendency to sin that allows bias to and trench itself in us and races and our culture and racism is something that's deeply entrenched in people at a social and a personal level so unfortunately that's really all the answer i can give not having read armor article so something to think about tim you have a question yes thank you so much for presenting um my question is uh, I'm wondering if Lonergan um, says anything uh, that you think is applicable to, or just your own opinion as a uh, historical scholar, about how we recognize figures in the past who may hold views that um, are liberative, hold views that are maybe helpful for our time, but who have kind of a sordid past. And I think, you know, we see. We see this uh, with the debates over, you know, which statues to take down um, or, you know, if we look at a figure like Thomas Jefferson, who writes, you know, is, is so fundamental to our understanding of uh, the Constitution of the United States um, in its broad constitution, in its broadest sense, but at the same time, like own slaves. So, but do you know if, uh, if Lonergan, Lonergan's perspective might shed light on how we how we view past figures that have this kind of sordid past? I mean, and I think I touched a little bit on this when I was talking about him, John A. MacDonald, and then going back and seeing that he was considered bigoted even for his own time. But um, I actually thought of Jefferson, too, when I was writing this, but I'm not American, so I just don't know enough. Of it. But um, I think this is one of the most difficult questions that I was thinking about when writing the paper, so thank you for asking it. I think there is something within the specialty of interpretation where Lonergan talks about, you know, going back and doing the difficult work of becoming a scholar, learning like the language, the history, the context, and really just getting into a person's head. And he talks about it in a way that I actually even thought of upon rereading the chapter for this paper could potentially be kind of dangerous when doing it for the work of like anti-racism and stuff because he's saying like you have to sort of learn to think how this person thinks and why they thought this way and see where they're coming from and i was like 
I don't want to do that with racist people. But I think that might be, though, where I would say, and someone else can jump in who might know better, but I'd say that I think would be where I would start is this idea of looking back and looking at the person through their own historical context, their own historical, they're obviously always bearing in mind that in our context, we know that this is a bad thing. But I think when you look at someone as best you can, I'd say the historical theologian in their historical context and try and understand what they do and why they're doing it, you can learn the difference. I can use an example as a medieval, primarily with some work in the, between um, certain, for example, certain crusaders who thought that they were actually doing the will of God and that they're doing it. And then other people who just really wanted to kill Muslims and the Pope was stamping a seal of approval on it. It's like, we look at it now and we know that either way, the crusades were not the right thing to do. But you, know, you can see when you look at the historical context, some people who really honestly believe that they were doing this. this is the bad answer i'm sorry some people who really honestly believe they're doing the right thing and others who just knew it was wrong and i think it's the same problem we have with society today is so yeah to answer your question it's a very good question i have to think more on it thank you so much yeah i mean it is it is a hard question everybody is grappling grappling with that now I, I, yeah. Steve, do you want to, you, you raised your hand, do you want to get a quick question in? I'll just add a quick comment that, that came up when Liam was talking, which is I think it's, I think that is, um, I agree that that interpretation and going back to understand, okay, what was Jefferson or McDonald, what was actually going on in their minds in their time as they were going through this can be helpful to us because that's more realistic as to how we can analyze our own time and our own selves, because we're likely not going to say, oh, I see this obvious racism in myself. We're going to say, well, I'm a very complex character. And to see those who we can recognize racism in as also complex characters can help us to see that, OK, the racism I'm looking for in myself is not necessarily obvious to me in a in a light shining kind of way but is going to be interwoven with the complexity of my good and my bad and my uncertainties. And so I think seeing them in a complex way, as Liam suggests, and I think Lonergan suggests, um, is not necessarily, is, is not, in my opinion, a way of, of uh, forgiving them or agreeing with them, but of finding a way to better analyze um, where racism or whatever other thing has kind of woven itself into what looks like a, um, a nice fabric sometimes. Thank you very much, Liam, for sharing this paper and opening up mm -hmm. these ideas for all of us that obviously it is, we do need to wrestle with these. So thank you. Thank you.